sing the song forever to the Lamb. If you walk in freedom, if you bear His name, sing the song forever to the Lamb. Sing the song. supper this morning. Uh, what an honor it is to, to be here this morning and, and do this as a church family together. And it's an honor for me to, to be up here. Um, and thank you, deacons, for your, for your service. Um, just remember a couple of things um, before we get started. Um, we'll be handing out, uh, the deacons will be coming around and serving you. There'll be two cups that are attached together, so just grab one and we'll have both your uh, uh, your bread and, and your juice in it together. Um, also remember that this, at, at First Baptist Edom, uh, we do a close communion, not a closed communion, meaning that if you're a believer in Christ and, and have been bapti baptized, um, you're welcome to, to take part in this um, with us. Um, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for for all your many blessings, Lord. Thank you for this church family. God, as we come to you this morning, God, I pray that everything we do will honor and glorify you, Lord. God, thank you so much, Lord, for, for the sacrifice that you made for us, Lord. God, we're undeserving and we're unworthy. And we didn't do anything to deserve your love, God, but you, you love us so much, Lord that you were willing, Lord, to let your body break for us. God, the book of Isaiah tells us, Lord, that your body was beyond human recognition, Lord. And that body, Lord, was for us in your love and your grace. God, the blood that you shed for us, Lord, 
to cover our sins, God, and oh, how sinful we are. But God, you cover that. It's paid, Lord. Our sins are paid because of your love. God, we thank you so much for that. God, I pray that we, we honor you this morning, Lord. God, we love you and we ask these things in your son's name. Amen.
Paul says in 1 Corinthians, um, on the night that he was betrayed, uh, the Lord Jesus broke, took and broke bread. He gave thanks and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, it says, he also took the cup after the supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. In the same way, I'm sorry, it says, for often as you drink, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God, we just, uh, we lift you up this morning, Lord. What a mighty and awesome God we serve. God, we thank you for, for loving us, Lord, so much. And God, I just pray that, that everything we do this morning, Lord, will honor you. And ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, good morning. Y'all awake? Man. Uh, It's a pleasure to be with you today and present God's word to you. Uh, Before we start, I'm going to open us up in a word of prayer. So if you would, please bow your heads and pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much uh, that we get to come together and fellowship with one another, Lord, that we get to worship you together, that we get to hear your word together, Lord, this morning. And God, I ask that we wouldn't be here this morning just going through the motions or checking our box. God, I ask that we would be here this morning to meet with you. Lord, I ask that we would be here this morning because we want to hear from you, God, that we want to receive a word from you, Lord, that we want to continue to grow in holiness, God, that uh, we desire to be righteous before you, God, that we want to be set apart from the world before you, Lord. God, I ask that the message that you've given me today, God, would... Speak to to even the hardest heart this morning, Lord. And Lord, that I would get out of the way. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would lead us this morning, Jesus. God, we thank you so much for your blood that was shed for us, your body that was broken for us. God, I thank you that through your death and through your resurrection, Lord, we can have fellowship with you. That we can come to you, Lord, free from sin and bondage, Lord. Thank you, God, that your your burden is light. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Okay, so this morning, um, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25 together. So if you have your copy of God's Word, you can go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 25. But before we read there, um, I want to say that if you're in this room this morning and you are a believer, you're a follower of Jesus, one thing that you should always be doing, and it's one thing that even the Apostle Paul constantly preached, is that you should be eagerly and anxiously awaiting the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. That whenever you live your life, every single day, you should be looking forward to his coming. The fact that he is going to be coming back one day and that we should be living our lives in such a way that Jesus' return is imminent. And that's really the focus of the passage that we're going to be in this morning in Matthew chapter 25. Um, before we get there, I want to read Revelation 19, 7 through 9. Um, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
And he said to me, these are the true words of God. I don't know about you, but this morning I am excited that one day I will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because God has come and he has changed me. I am a new person. His spirit dwells within me. And that is something that we look forward to as believers. In Matthew chapter 24, the disciples are asking Jesus, Jesus, when are you going to come back? When is your return going to be? And Jesus goes on in Matthew chapter 24 and starts talking about the kingdom of heaven and what it's going to look like when he returns for his second coming. And I want to tell you right now that we've been waiting since Jesus' death for him to come back. And today, there has never been a closer time for Jesus' return than right now. Every day that you live, Jesus' return is even more imminent. And they preached that 2,000 years ago, that his return was imminent, and that's the same today, that his return is imminent. Every day you live is a possibility that Jesus could come back. To understand this parable that we're going to be in this morning, we also have to take a little bit of a look at a Jewish wedding ceremony. I learned a lot, actually, studying for this sermon this week, Um, and so... It helps to read it in its context, but before we get started, uh, if you would stand and read God's word with me, Uh, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25, uh, starting in verse 1, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the elders and buy something for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert, then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. You may be seated. Uh, And so Jesus is is teaching his disciples with a parable here. He is relating to their culture, to to their time, and he talks uh, about a Jewish wedding. Uh, And in a Jewish wedding in that day, there were three stages that took place. First was like the stage of engagement where the fathers would get together and they would come to a formal agreement uh, on the the wedding of their children, a son uh, and a daughter. Um, And when a boy was young, the parents of that boy would begin to look for uh, a proper spouse for their son uh, to marry. They would look at the family, they'd look at how the family lived, what they did for a job. Um, And then they would come together, the families would, and they would have an arrangement Um, and a promise that when their children were old enough, they would get married. And I don't know how many of y'all know me very well, but I have experienced this in my own personal life. I have had an arranged marriage before, and I can tell you it is the best way to go for for somebody to arrange the marriage. Uh, Pastor Craig uh, had this daughter named Allie, and I got to know Pastor Craig really well, and Allie didn't know it at the time, but Craig was working something up, Uh, and he got in his office, and he was scheming, and um, I had been involved in the college ministry for a little bit, and I don't don't know what it was, but all of a sudden, I liked his daughter, and it's Craig's fault. That's all I'm going to (laughs) say, and and then we got married, and Craig to this day will tell you it was an arranged marriage, Uh, but I can tell you that it's it's been awesome. It's been amazing, Um, but all joking aside... As you go through uh, this process, the, the second step was the betrothal, and there would be a, a ceremony where mutual promises are made, uh, and at this betrothal, the woman was legally married to her husband at this point, uh, although she would still remain in her father's house. She could not belong to another man unless she was divorced from her betrothed, and then the third was the, the marriage, the ceremony, the festivities, and approximately one year later, the bridegroom would come at an unexpected time for his bride. The bridegroom would come at an unexpected time for his bride, and when he came, the bridesmaids who were attending the bride went forth, and they would meet the bridegroom as he was coming to the bride's house, and they would have lamps lit, uh, and they would conduct him and his companions into the house, 
and to the bride, and whenever the bridegroom would receive his bride, they would all return to his home, and then there would be a great celebration there. When we're in our text today in our parable, the first two stages have already taken place, and now the wedding party, the ten virgins, wait for the coming of the bridegroom for his bride. And so we've read Matthew chapter 25, and in this parable, Jesus gives his disciples the assurance of his return and provides instructions on how we should live in light of his coming. So what does this parable teach us today? Number one, my first point is that oil is necessary. Oil is necessary. I'm going to read verse 1 through 3 through 4 for you. It says, The kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they had no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flasks along with their lamps. Oil in scripture many times refers to the Holy Spirit. For example, on several occasions, Jesus himself talked about being anointed with the Holy Spirit. Anointing in those days was performed by oil upon the head. Uh, And Christians, Paul will tell us, that are, are also anointed as well. God anoint, or 2 Corinthians 1, 21 says, God anointed us set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. 1 John 2, 20 through 21 says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie, and that no lie is of the truth. Uh, there is this word for, for anointing, uh, and it's called chrisma. Uh, And it's having been marked out or touched with the special endowment of the Holy Spirit. 1 John 2, 26 through 27 says, These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone to teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true, it is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide with him. When a person becomes a Christian, a born-again believer in Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your life. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in your heart. Life in Jesus Christ is different because now the Spirit of God is in you and with you. The Holy Spirit is there to empower us. The Holy Spirit is there to equip us. The Holy Spirit is there for us to function in the gifts of ministry that God has given us. He is our helper. He is our advocate. He protects us and encourages us. And I want to let you know something right now that if you're trying to do stuff for the Lord without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, your ministry is going to be ineffective because you can't do anything under your own power. You have to have total and complete reliance upon the Lord trusting in him and trusting that he has a better way than you do. And that comes by inviting the Lord to work in our hearts and work in our lives every single day. We need the Holy Spirit in us if we're going to be effective ministers of the gospel. The Holy Spirit is so necessary when it is doing ministry. I can tell you right now that uh, when I find myself in a place trying to operate out of my own flesh, operate out of my own power, that I fail and I fail miserably It's because God knows better than I do. God knows better how to reach that hardened heart. God knows better how to reach that family, that person that you've been praying for. He knows better than I do. And if I'm trying to do it myself, I will fail. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness that we belong to Christ. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 through 17 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. The Holy Spirit is our seal. It's our stamp of ownership. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you are sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. And the sealing that Paul talks about here to the church of Ephesians in chapter 1 would be like a signet ring where the king stamps his seal on a letter. It's showing that this is from the king, that this is belonging to the king, that this is the king's mark. 
So whenever you are sealed in the Holy Spirit, it's showing that you are marked by God. You are marked by Jesus. And that will be evident in your life. And so that is, uh, that's the idea of being sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it, and it, as, it, as we talk about the Holy Spirit, as we talk about this and being anointed with oil and oil, it's important for us to understand that in this parable. Because it's what's in the lamp when we read this that matters. Did you notice the similarities between these virgins? They were all present. They were all somewhat prepared. They all had lamps. They were all waiting for the bridegroom to come and welcome them to the wedding feast. They all turned up and they all slept. They all slept. All ten of them, not just five, but they all slept. They drifted off into sleep. But some were prepared and some were not. And so there are similarities here, but it's the difference that really matters. The girls all looked the same, but they were not. Our text tells us when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. Only half of them were ready for the feast and went in to enjoy the festivities with the bride and the groom, and the door was shut. What a warning, church. I believe that this parable is here specifically for this reason, to warn us. It tells us that there are many in church and Christian company, and yet they're still a stranger to the Holy Spirit. There are many people that are going to sit in church pews and church chairs and, and do all the church things, but they are still a stranger to the Spirit of God. They don't know him, and he doesn't know them. It is possible to have a lamp that looks good, trimmed and polished, but have no oil in it. Are you here today with your lamp lacking oil? The five virgins who had extra olive oil represent truly born-again believers who are looking with eagerness to the coming of Christ. The five virgins without oil represent false believers who enjoy the benefits of Christian community without a true love for Christ. This parable is not about spirit-filled believers and non-spirit-filled believers. This parable is about people who are truly born again and false believers, people who are not born again. So don't get the two confused. This is a warning from Jesus Because he knows that people are going to want to play the part, but have no skin in the game. Hmm. Guys, I used to be here once, (laughs) and I can play the part better than any of you. I can. So don't think that just because you've gone to church one day, or that your parents have gone to church your whole life, that you're an exception Because that was me. This this parable also teaches us about a false hope. The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, no, there will not be enough for us, and you too, go instead to the dealer and buy some for yourself. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Part of their hope was that just because they associated themselves with the church and with believers, that they would be able to go into the kingdom at the end. And this, of course, is not the the case. One person's faith in Jesus cannot save another. Uh, Matthew 7 fits here perfectly where it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles and I will declare to them I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, they asked the other ones that were actually prepared, that were actually full of the, that had oil. They asked for some of theirs and they said, no, go get some for yourself. This is not selfishness of the prudent virgins. Rather, what Jesus is illustrating here is that you cannot borrow somebody else's faith. You're not going to get to heaven based off of me. You're not going to get to heaven based off of your parents. Kids, you're not going to get to heaven. Your parents are going to get to heaven based off of you. 
You have to have your own authentic relationship with Jesus and have your own authentic Holy Spirit-filled life with him in order to enter into the wedding feast, in order to be welcomed into the presence of the Lord on that day when he returns. There is, there is a necessity for you to have your own authentic relationship with him, not based off of how you grew up or what your mama and your daddy told you. That is not what gets you into the kingdom of heaven. You cannot borrow somebody else's obedience. <laughs> you have to be obedient yourself. A lot of people come to church and do the, the church thing, but actually there is emptiness between them and Christ. Their lamp is empty. No one can enter the kingdom of heaven unless he or she is born again by the spirit of the living God. The next thing this, this, this parable shows us, it shows us a lot, is does your life show that you are ready? Does your life show that you are ready? Believers live a life waiting expectantly. The prudent virgins were ready because they had oil and were prepared beforehand. Being ready for Christ's return we must be born again through saving faith in Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which you also received, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you as first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, he was buried and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Those who have come to saving faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior enter into a radically new and different way of life. They have come from death to life and from the pursuit of sin to the pursuit of God. That is what it looks like to be ready. You leave your life, your old self, it's crucified. That old man is dead. And you leave that life of sin behind and you live for Christ. That is what looks completely and radically different. Those who have experienced salvation now enter into the process of sanctification, where the old man, the old me, is put to death and the new me the, in Christ continues to be conformed to the image of Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. The sexually immoral, idolaters, adulterers, passive homosexual partners, practicing homosexuals, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, the verbally abusive, and swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Some of you once lived this way, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Saving faith in Jesus will manifest itself in every aspect of your life. The fruit of the, the fruit of the Spirit will begin to show. You will have a continuing desire for holiness and less desire for sin. There will be a consistent eagerness and longing for the return of our King. One of the best passages articulating this, I believe, is Titus 2, 11 through 14, of what it's, what it, a picture of what it looks like to, to live eagerly waiting for his return. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed, to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. The five virgins who have extra oil represent what it is truly to be born again and what it looks like to look forward to the coming of Christ. And we need to be living like he is going to return at any moment. Paul preached this. The apostle Peter preached this when he, pre when he wrote the book of 1 Peter. He was talking to exiles, and he's talking about how their lives are really hard, and they're going through hardship, and they've been run out from their land, and he tells them to wait anxiously for his return. 
Jude does the same thing. Jude encourages Christians who live in a generation of false conversions, false teachings, false prophets to wait eagerly for the Lord's return. Are you eager for his return? If you're not, you need to be asking yourself, do I look like one of these foolish virgins? Maybe your attitude is similar to theirs. I'll get serious with Jesus later. Maybe I can just get oil in the last minute. Let me tell you this morning that later might be too late for you, just as it was for them. When I was preparing this, I felt like the Lord uh, put the example of Noah on my heart. (laughs) In Matthew 24, it says, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So the coming of the Son of Man will also be. Did you guys know that Noah was a preacher of righteousness and the coming judgment? And you know what? The people of his day were foolish and did not heed his word either. And when the flood came, you know what door was shut? The door of the ark. And all those people experienced the judgment of God because they did not heed the warning. The door was shut. There is not an infinite amount of times that you can respond to the king's invitation. There is not an infinite amount of times. You're not, when Jesus comes back, that is it. When you pass from this life to the next, that is it. The door is shut. And we're not going to be able to run, we're not going to be able to run to the door that's closed and say, but Jesus, look, I have a lamp too. But Jesus, but Jesus, we're not going to be able to just hope that he's going to hold the door open for us. He doesn't hold the door open until they get back from buying their oil. They went to buy oil from the merchants and they came back and it was shut and they were not let in. And so the last question that I have for you is, does Jesus know you? Is your name written in the Lamb's book of life? Do you have a personal and authentic relationship with Jesus? Verse 11 says, Later the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour Again, I want to remind you that it is possible to know your Bible but not know Jesus. It is possible to know what you were taught in Sunday school but not have a relationship with Jesus. It is possible to regurgitate whatever you listen to on YouTube or whatever, whatever you do, whatever your Sunday school t- teacher taught you, but not have a relationship with Jesus. It's possible for you to remember that you were baptized when you were five years old and mommy and daddy told you that you have a relationship with Jesus, but if you don't have one for yourself because you've experienced and encountered the love of Christ and it has changed your life, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. The foolish are those who have no more than superficial knowledge of the scriptural truth. They believe in the Bible, but not in the Lord of the Bible. Your faith has to go deeper than doctrine. Knowledge is worthless unless it leads to the surrender of yourself over to Jesus. And so are you ready to meet the Lord today? Have you been born again? In John chapter 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. And I tell you the same thing. Unless you are born again, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. The only way to experience a new birth, a total rebirth, is to place your faith in Jesus, to repent. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus started his ministry, and the first sermon that he preached was one sentence, and it was that they needed to repent because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. It wasn't a watered-down message full of butterflies and rainbows that you're going to get at most places today. It was, there is a problem in your heart, and it is sin and your separation with God. And there is a king who is on earth, walking around in the midst of you, and he is here to save you. He is here to heal you. He is here to take up your bondage upon himself. And you must repent and walk away from that form of life and live for him. 
And you know what? That's exactly what Jesus did. That's exactly what we just remembered this morning when we took communion, is that Jesus shed his blood for us so that when he comes back on that day, those that are still left here will be able to enter into the wedding feast if we have professed our faith and love and devotion to him. And that is what I want for each and every single one of you in this room this morning, is for when Jesus comes back, that you don't just say, oh, I have a lamp, but that your life is full of oil, that your life is full of the Holy Spirit, and that you're found living for him and nothing else. Jesus wants to come back and find that your lamp has oil. Jesus wants to come back and find that you haven't just been going through the motions, but that you've been living for him, that you were prudent and that you were ready. The good news is, is that if you are here today, guess what? The door is still open for you. The door is still open for you. Jesus is still calling you. Jesus is still beckoning you to come to him, to leave your sinful self behind, to leave your old lifestyle behind, to come and follow him, to place your faith in him. God's word promises that Whenever you place your faith in Jesus, that he makes you into a new creation. The old things of your life are gone and that the new things have come. You will have God's stamp of approval on your life. And the Holy Spirit will come and fill your heart. And guess what? Your lamp will be full of oil. Finally, as a believer, as the band comes up, I want to challenge believers for a second. The church is not here to sit around and stare at each other. The church isn't here for us to just do home group and go to Sunday school. I believe that's a vital part of community. We're on this earth to be salt and light. And we're here to proclaim like Paul that we are not ashamed of the gospel. We are not ashamed of the gospel of truth because it is the power of God for the salvation of anyone who would believe. And when we talk about a passage like this, I know many of you just want to like jump into your view of eschatology and I am not going to sit up here and preach that. <laughs> I'm just not. But it brings up an interesting point that I want to challenge you with. Is what are you most motivated about? Because a lot of us would probably rather sit down with a group of people and talk about whether we're a pre-millennial dispensationalist, an all-millennial, a post-millennial, a historical pre-millennial. It doesn't matter what that is, honestly, because Jesus is going to come back when Jesus comes back, right? But your job right now is to share the gospel with everybody around you. The problem is, is we get so focused and caught up in all these things that have no significant eternal impact, when in reality, we are called to be salt and, life and salt and light in this earth and share the gospel to the world around us. Because Jesus is coming back one day, and we want everybody that we know to be part of that marriage supper with the Lamb, right? We're not here to predict the end of the world. We're not here that when every time Apple drops a new device that that's the mark of the beast. That's not my job, and that's not your job. Your job is to be ready and to share the good news of Jesus until he returns. And so are you zealous for that? Are you zealous for good deeds? Are you living righteously in the sight of God until the return of the bridegroom? So as we enter into this time of invitation, I want to challenge you that if If the Lord has pressed something upon your heart, maybe you're here today and you've realized that I have a lamp, but I have no oil in my lamp, and I need a saving relationship with Jesus. Please come talk with me or somebody standing around the room. And if you're a Christian here this morning and you saying, look, I've failed. I've been so caught up in things that don't matter, and I need to repent and become before the king and say, Jesus, this is what's most important in my life, and I'm sorry then that's what I'm calling you to. If you need to come up to the altar and pray for somebody that you know is not gonna be part of that wedding feast, come and pray for them. We're here for you. If, you. if you're struggling with something and you need somebody to help lift up your burdens that you have in your life, come pray with us. That's what this time is for. Let me pray. God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this warning, God. I thank you that you love us enough to warn us, Jesus. God, I thank you that the door is still open. Lord, that if we do not have a relationship with you, God, that door is still open. You have not come back. You have not gone into the wedding feast, Lord. 
Lord, I thank you that there is still a chance, there is still a moment, Lord, where we can come to you, Lord, that we can humble ourselves, that we can repent and turn from our ways, Jesus, and follow after you, Jesus. God, that there is nothing greater than a relationship with you, Lord. Nothing in this world will satisfy, only you will. Lord, I pray for the believer, the non-believer in this room, God, that, that does not know you. Lord, that they would heed your warning and that they would come to you, Jesus, and that they would enter into the most fruitful thing they could ever have, which is a relationship with you. Lord, I pray for the believer in this room, God, that, that we would come before you, God, that, that we would uh, repent of, of the ways, God, that maybe we're not serving you, Lord, that we would be convicted of those ways. Lord, and how we can share the gospel better. Lord, because there is a day and it is imminent and it is coming where you will return, King Jesus. I thank you for your love for us, Lord. It's your name I pray, amen.